Okay, uh, so our next uh, section is on legal considerations of election machine hacking. Uh, Joseph Lorenzo Hall is the chief uh, technologist and director of the Internet Architecture Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology. And Candace Hoke is a legal expert and founder of the Center for Election Integrity. And so with that, I will turn it over to you, Candace, to start. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Jake. Um, welcome, everyone. I'll stay over here. Um, uh, it may seem strange to have a law professor here. I'm happy to also tell you that I uh, hold a, an information security degree from Carnegie Mellon, and I've been working with this crowd for over 10 years on election security, uh, which, as you've already discovered, uh, leaves a great deal to be desired. Um, uh, you want to flip to my next? Uh, part of what I want you to recognize, and maybe you already do, is that law is both a cause and potentially a cure for election security. Uh, the way we got into this disaster with uh, e-voting and election tech was from a legal mandate out of Washington where uh, those who did not understand uh, security vulnerabilities uh, at all um, assumed that we would solve the nation's problems in voting by simply moving to electronic voting. And it was basically a mandate to the states. And it, we could say much more in a complex way, but uh, there will be more later this afternoon about that. Um, and of course, it is a matter of state as well as federal law. Let's go to, um, so first I'd like to just quickly flip through some of the consequences of election hacking just to remind us what's at stake. We probably all think we know what's at stake, but let me just remind you. So let's quickly move through these. At the federal level, we have not only Congress and the president, but also by uh, indirect, uh, indirectly, we have the whole judiciary, the US Supreme Court, all the way down, uh, affected by the election results. Uh, all 50 states, here are just a few state capitals, and of course, all three branches of their uh, state governments plus then local governments uh, such as these we know, but there are the hamlets, the counties, et cetera. Um, th they are all directly affected by elections and whether they operate correctly. Uh, there are, there's vast amounts of money at stake, um, as well as issues such as global warming and environmental uh, policy, uh, military and foreign affairs, uh, healthcare delivery and healthcare systems, uh, surveillance, something that many of us in this crowd care about greatly. Uh, we're talking about trillions of dollars at stake, plus the greatest military power in the world, uh, directly affected by how our elections are conducted. So. Um, we do have legal complexity, as we saw from the prior panel's uh, discussion. Uh, there are many who, <laughs> who, who work under the misconception that the state governments actually control, under the US Constitution, the entirety of election administration, meaning election tech, election management, um, et cetera. And the fact of the matter is that the U.S. Constitution, as I mentioned at the end of the, uh, in the question period in the last session, is that the U.S. Constitution explicitly says that the states shall until Congress chooses to do otherwise. How broad congressional power is, it's really never been fathomed because Congress has tended to be less than active over time. Um, but it's not to say that dormant power could be exercised. And, and I do want to go on record s s uh, urging you to uh, understand that by no means do I think the feds are the smartest people in the room and that they can be trusted on election security uh, to the uh, exclusion or to the detriment of the state officials. I think that there are smart people and dedicated people to election security and fairness at every level. Um, uh, the problem often is that uh, we have uh, laws and practices and customs and uh, misunderstandings about technology and security at every level as well. Um, so I did want you to understand the core conflict 
behind a great deal of what's going on as far as uh, the, the legal framework for dealing with election security issues. Now, uh, a, a principle in law that many do not recognize is the one on the right, and that is the, the goal of repose or finality. In law, in litigation, for instance, and in, in we, we recognize that we will not have a perfect system, that we will never be able to obtain 100% of the evidence that's relevant in the time periods as necessary, and we may not be able to produce, uh, even if there were a theoretically perfect um, judgment. So we have to get as close as we can and then close the books and move on. Well, what if in a particular litigation, for instance, concerning, we'll, we'll just say, who, who, uh, read a, a, who ran a red light and hit a bus, that after the judgment, we discovered some conclusive evidence that showed that the verdict was wrong. Can we come back in and reopen five years later and change that judgment? And the answer generally is no, we want to close. So, Finality is very important in the legal system, settled expectations, but it also, as you can see and think in, in the election context as well, it runs uh, roughshod uh, in opposition to accuracy, integrity, and sometimes justice. Uh, in the election situation, it could mean, for instance, that we choose or a state chooses to move forward into finality and governing and, and, and um, basically inaugurating its new governor or um, its new state legislature being sworn in rather than having a process that would allow the investigation of the election technology, uh, forensics, whatever, uh, that would then possibly cause the uh, election conclusions to be in doubt. Keep going. So um, we have lots of threats. As we know, this is only a subsection. You're going to be hearing more about threats later in the day. Um, those of us in this room know the uh, broad range of vulnerabilities. They're being exploited right now. Um, one would think that if the election machinery is as vulnerable as it is, easily exploitable, uh, easily hacked, that we would have processes for being able to ascertain, legal processes, to be able to ascertain and correct for errors in the system. You would expect that, right? Companies have that. And in fact, we require under um, our healthcare law, uh, the HIPAA law and our financial services laws, um, there are mandates for that, when I say mandates, regulatory mandates uh, reg regarding security and also auditing throughout the systems and, and uh, disclosure of breaches. None of that exists in the election systems, none. And the states differ substantially in the ways they um, proceed on particular uh, questions or election challenges. So for instance, some states have an approach that requires, um, in order to even bring a contest for an election where there is the perception or even some proof, reasonable proof of hacking of the election, they require actual proof before even filing or as, as a condition of filing the litigation. Most litigation, the way we proceed is by filing a lawsuit and then being able to develop the evidence. You can't do that in elections. For these states, you are required to actually have the proof in advance. And I ask you, how many of us would be able to gather the proof of hacked, a hacked election in advance to be able to, as a, a condition precedent, as we would say, to file the lawsuit and to proceed? So in other words, those states, we can go back to the, to the we can go, yeah. Those states are much more about finality and throwing a cloak over the election process and just moving on. And you can imagine that that is actually, and I've written about this, that's actually an invitation to hackers, come hack here because we aren't going to be watching. We aren't going to look. Have a field day because 
Our laws are structured so we will not find out. Uh, and even if we do, we won't be able to proceed to correct in time. Then there are other states that actually have a different approach, and that is typical litigation. You can file, you can challenge a particular office, um, it's winter, and that office will not be filled until the litigation has concluded and, of course, evidence has to be produced. But then the question becomes, can, can those challengers actually uh, require the systems to be subject to a forensics analysis? And this is where some of the, the uh, litigations for the 2016 election foundered because the answers frequently were, oh no, you can't look and you can't make us look. So again, it was, we'll throw a cloak over what happened, nobody's going to look too closely. We all know in the security world you can't operate a secure system if no one's looking. And there are legal barriers to actually analyzing, assessing the conduct and the technology. So the law really is a problem when it comes to election security. Um, at the state level, we have additional problems, some of which, uh, for instance, uh, Jake referred to um, when he, he said uh, one of the goals is to erase the word unhackability from the election industry vocabulary. Uh, we hear it all the time that our systems are unhackable or we run secure systems. Trust us, you don't need to look, no one needs to look. We would actually endanger our system security by allowing forensics analysis or any other kind of analysis. Now, politically, those who are in charge of the election system by law are often ones who want to run for office again, and they, unfortunately, believe that if problems are found in the technology, it will then be attributed to them personally that they have failed. They're not running successful elections. Now, let me unpack that again. What happens at the Secretary of State level <clears throat> and sometimes at the local level is that the election officials sort of feel one with their technology. They identify with their technology. Their own success, their own sort of integrity rests upon whether that technology is secure and and trustworthy. And frankly, we all know it's not. And further, the last presentation and David's and Barber's also showed you there's no reason for us to trust that technology, but it is not those election officials' fault. This is the only technology that was available and was certified by their predecessors to run, and that was purchased using that three billion plus in federal funds that, by the way, by law, by federal law, had to be used by the states to buy technology before the standards and testing system had actually been set up and produced standards. So repeat, Congress required the $3 billion to be spent on legacy systems that we already knew were flawed. They were from the 1990s and the early 2000s with 2003 for five dollars before the security standards and the testing apparatus had been set up. Roughly 85 percent of all votes in the United States are being cast on this technology today. The complicated and much more vigorous um, federal testing system, and which is a third-party independent system now, plus the uh, security standards, um, very little of our technology has run through that system at all. The certification, the qualification, the testing. And yes, although uh, it's all been voluntary, at least that is some protection. Um, so what we end up with is a terrible situation with voting systems and, and we'll just say entire election technologies that do not deserve any, we'll say, respect as secure technologies, 
but election officials routinely consider themselves to be personally accused of having lack of in integrity and lack of faithfulness to the voters if they are, if the, the, the technology itself is being accused, being challenged for being insecure. So one of the techniques I would mention to you when underscore is it's very important to separate election officials from the technology and to remind them you were saddled with this. Not you, the, the, the most important, meaning not your decision. The best you can do is to authorize the transparency, the, the accountability systems that we use in security operations generally, and that way you will be, we will applaud you, we will praise you publicly, but you have to work with this community because you have technologies that cannot otherwise be trusted. Um, let me see a few other things. Um, so, thank you. Um, so our mis the mistaken policy drivers uh, in this field, uh, the assumptions and frequent statements are that votes and registrations can't be easily modified, that any errors that occur in tabulations or voter registrations are small and insignificant, it would be way too expensive to examine elections too closely, so we're not gonna do it. It would also take too long, and that would uh, prevent the orderly process of the system as far as inaugurations and swearing into office. Um, and also, again, that election officials are fearful of being held publicly and sometimes criminally responsible if the elections um, if evidence is produced that the elections were not run uh, in an accurate, secure manner. And it is true, there are some standards in some states that could be read that way, and election officials tend to believe that forensics analyses are only used when there is a criminal investigation. Joe's gonna go into criminal uh, consequences very shortly, but I do uh, wanna underscore again that there are a number of election officials who have set up forensics assessments, including some I've been involved in, that where uh, important evidence has been produced of network connections, vote changes, um, other kinds of problems uh, that very would would uh, shock and uh, disturb anybody who knows uh, just a little about security. Um, so. Uh, we have at the state level uh, a number of issues that need to be addressed through the laws. I don't think they're going to be addressed at the federal level. Um, uh, we could and I think we should have laws for recounts that are going to support forensics assessments um, and David and I, and I don't think anybody else on that team is here, we wrote a forensics guide for election officials back in 2008 that the American Bar Association published. It's still available. Um, uh, we do need to have um, routine post-election auditing. Um, we need to have, I would say, even routine forensics assessments of elections. I worked with DHS last summer on developing some uh, proposals for how DHS could be involved in network uh, scanning for probes, uh, particularly uh, from outside the United States into our election systems. Um, but overall, we should recognize um, our systems are vulnerable. They do need to be replaced, but in the meantime, there are multiple types of security activities that this community and the offices could engage in, and we should be working together on that. So, um, Joe? Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Yep. Hi, everyone. My name is Joe. I'm from the Center for Democracy and Technology in Washington, D.C. Um, I've been working on this stuff for a long time. Um, uh, and you can kind of think of me as half lawyer, half computer scientist, um, but not technically either of those, but um, uh, 
it's complicated. You're welcome to look me up online and figure out the rest. Um, just to give you some quick uh, uh, words on motivation, I told Kenneth I wasn't going to talk about this, but why not? Um, you know, elections are really complicated, and hopefully if you've been here so far today, you've realized that it's, it's a lot of stuff uh, operating in, in, in very close proximity to each other and have to be connected well. So we always talk about them as being people, processes, and technology. And, you know, much of that process is the law. And, and so there are things that have to be done certain ways because the law says it is. That doesn't mean we can't change the laws <laughs> to do different things, and often we do, and, we, and I can talk about places where we have specifically sought to and changed the law to allow for higher security processes and technologies to be allowed to be used in elections. Um, but, and so Candace just talked about a lot of this general legal landscape and some uh, of the civil law considerations. I'm gonna talk uh, about criminal law and some of the more tech law kinds of things that you might run into if you're gonna uh, start playing with voting systems. So in terms of the general legal landscape here, um, let me see if I can, um, as we've been talking about, elections are mostly governed by states. Uh, they all, all of them criminal, criminalize some form of tampering with voting equipment, voting supplies, voter ballots, and stuff like that, as they should. So in general, you know, if you've ever been in the lock picking village here at DEF CON, and if you haven't, you should go check it out. It's a lot of fun. Um, they always talk about, like the tool folks always talk about, hey, the first two rules of picking locks is uh, you don't pick one that's in use and you don't pick one you don't own. And I think that goes for voting systems as well. Um, it's, it, they're hard to get your hands on, which is why this is really awesome today. We have some here. Some of them are no longer used anymore. Some of them are still being used, and some uh, vendors have even uh, been gracious enough to bring them and l allow you to kick the tires. So please go, and even if you've never done any hacking, we can show you a little bit about um, uh, what you can and cannot do with some of these systems. Um, I really think that disclosure here is, is very different than disclosure in general purpose um, computing, and what I mean by disclosure is vulnerability disclosure. And um, so for example, the, uh, uh, um, the, there was the SQL injection, which means someone put special characters into a form field on a voter registration website to get access to the underlying database, and were able to get 90,000 voter records out of that. Um, that's a good example of one where the, uh, the, our intelligence community and the FBI noticed that, and then uh, sent a lot of the details of that particular attack to various other states. Some election officials never even heard about that. So it, it, there's, a, there's still a pretty big information sharing and communication problem here in terms of getting actionable uh, intelligence down to the state and local entities. And there's, there's some work I'm going to be doing in the next two years. By the way, if you're looking for a job and you know something about cybersecurity and election technology, come talk to me. I have a job. Um, uh, and so I think that's a, a good uh, that's one way disclosure works. The other way is exactly what uh, uh, um, Logan came up here and talked about when he was talking about, you know, poking around and then uh, trying his damnedest to get Kennesaw State to recognize the shortcomings in, in a misconfiguration of their own system, and it even took another person checking it again and telling them, look, it's still not fixed before that happened. I'd like to believe that it's, it's better now, um, but, you know, only, only they will know, and hopefully they're doing things that are sort of regular assessments of their infrastructure, um, but we'll have to ask Merle about that, and I'm sure um, he has thoughts. Um, so, get into the good stuff. Some of the criminal stuff here that you could run into if, if you do things incorrectly, uh, you know, actually messing with equipment that is gonna be used in an election is a really bad idea. Just to give you an example, and I can cite some of this stuff from other states, but um, you know, a lot of these things don't even require you to, to have an intent to, to commit fraud, right? They just, it, doing something to hack or tamper with the equipment itself is enough, even if you didn't mean to and stuff. So for example, in California, you can check it out, California Elections Code 18564 has this list of things that are criminally, criminal offenses for voting equipment and voting supplies that'll get you two to four years in prison uh, at a minimum. Um, so if you tamper with, interfere with the correct operation or you willfully damage uh, a voting machine, voting device, voting system, vote tabulation device, or ballot tally software, you can get in trouble. Um, if you interfere or attempt to interfere with the secrecy of voting or ballot tally software, you can get in trouble. Um, and then without authorization, modulo who can give you authorization to do this, makes or has in your possession a key to a voting machine. And if you know about voting machines, as, as Barbara mentioned earlier, uh, they're often not keyed in a way that are meant to keep people out of them very long. You know, the, the proverbial voter, uh, excuse me, hotel minibar key is a good example, or you can, some of them, are, they're more like 
um, filing cabinet uh, locks. But lately, I've seen some vendors actually sort of put serious thought into keying their equipment to actually being difficult for someone like me who can, you know, throw a four pin lock pretty easily um, to get into. Uh, anyway, and actually putting things, like sometimes you can actually move part of the plastic case aside without having to do anything with the lock. So putting rigid uh, uh, borders in certain things have been a, a new thing. And then there's stuff like willfully substituting forged ballot tally software that then ends up being used in an election. All those things can get you in, in pretty serious trouble and on the wrong end of a prosecutor in the state of California. And many other states have things that are like this. Some of them are much vaguer, which means they may have a little bit more discretion. Um, anyway, and there's other, there's other things. This is just equipment, right? There's other things that they could slap on to add to those charges if they really want to make an example of you. So you should be careful and make sure you're talking to someone who knows about the law before you try and do any of this stuff. And hopefully you do it in conjunction with an election official because, you know, uh, we, hackers are going to be election officials' best friends, and election officials uh, love making their stuff better, at least the, the ones I talk to. Um, the Digital Millennium, Digital Millennium Copyright Act is something that Barbara mentioned that is, uh, is definitely um, a problem here in the sense that it, 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 it makes it illegal, and you can uh, be criminally um, prosecuted or uh, uh, the, the, someone can bring a civil action against you, so the, like a business that, that makes voting machines. Um, for violating Section 1201 of the DMCA. And Section 1201 basically says that you cannot, it's illegal to circumvent certain kinds of technical measures. So to descramble a scrambled work, to decrypt an encrypted work, or to otherwise avoid, gosh, that's a horrible word, bypass, remove, deactivate, or impair a technological measure without authorization. And there the authorization, it's always been a little clear who it needs to be. Does it need to be the person who owns the system or does it need to be the original manufacturer? You can imagine it's, it's difficult to get permission from the original manufacturer to do some of this stuff, um, although we have done it. Um, this shirt, as a matter of fact, Ohio, I fi Ohio Fixed Your Voting System, is from 2007 when we did the top to bottom review in the state of California, along with a bunch of people here like Harry Hursty and Matt Blaze. Um, um, anyway, um, Barbara did mention that there was an exemption granted from this part of the DMCA uh, last year. And uh, that's actually that's that's wonderful and true. And and so the, the uh, uh, copyright office granted exemptions from being able to circumvent technological measures for voting systems, for land motorized vehicles. You can think of those as cars. Um, and then something else that I'm forgetting: medical devices. And so the medical devices and vehicles. They said, oh. We're gonna give agencies 12 months before people can start hacking that so you can prepare for this onslaught of wonderful ownage you're gonna have. Um, but for voting mach machines, they didn't actually, they said you can just start hacking those now. And so this is something that's actually been alive for a while and it's one of the reasons we can do this here at DEF CON because we don't have to be so worried about people uh, getting in trouble just because we have machines and they're uh, uh, getting, their, getting around them. Um, the trick here is that you know, the circumvention, there's a lot of words in that exemption. And the circumvention that you're doing to, to get access to these machines has to be on a lawfully acquired device, and it has to be um, where you do it only for what's called good faith security research. And a lot of us that work on the policy side of security and security systems, that word good faith makes us feel a little antsy. And the reason it makes us feel antsy is that uh, one judge's idea of what good faith may be uh, uh, completely different than yours or from uh, uh, or another judge's for that matter. So you may actually have two different things going here. And here, what they talk about in terms of good faith is actually kind of complicated. And, and I'm actually going to read it. Sorry. Accessing a computer pr program solely for the purposes of good faith testing. So they use the word good faith in the definition of good faith. Um, which is sort of a problem. Uh, investigation and or correction of a security flaw or vulnerability where the information derived from the activity is used primarily to promote the security or safety of the classes of the devices or machines. So if you're just doing it for fun, that's not good faith. Uh, so you have to actually want to be sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, you actually want to try and help these systems and, and fix these systems. And so if they ask you why you're doing it, tell them you want to help and fix the systems. Um, but we're going to have to renew this exemption this year. So please contact me at CDT. There's a couple people from EF. There's a bunch of people from EFF here. They're all working on making sure these exemptions are renewed. And, and call your Congress critter and tell them that you want to see these things made permanent so that we always have the ability to do this kind of work. 
Um, so, and really quick, and then we get to the fun part questions. The other big uh, statute here that you may have heard of, uh, uh, but if you haven't, I'm gonna talk about it, the Computer Fraud Abuse Act, and it basically criminalizes gaining unauthorized access to certain kinds of computer systems and networks. Um, exactly, boo. And one of the reasons this is such a, uh, I mean, there's a lot of good done with this law, I must say, <laughs> you know, recognizing that we wanna fight crime online, like people who leave their employer and take a bunch of uh, credentials and then hack back in and then destroy the system just because they're mad, you know, that's criminal behavior. Um, but unauthorized access is not defined, and so if you may have known about the case of Weave, not my favorite person in the world, he's now the system in for the Nazis, uh, but anyway, Weave incremented a counter in the URL uh, uh, with a little program, and that was considered enough to, to sort of trigger this. That's an older case, and I think the DOJ folks, if there's any in the room, would recognize that they're trying not to do things like that anymore, but, but it has happened, it could happen again. Um, the Illinois case from last year that I talked about where supposedly Russian intelligence, the, the GRU or the FSB, um, used an, a SQL injection to both exfiltrate 90,000 voter uh, records, so not all voters in the state of Illinois, hopefully, um, but a yeah. good chunk of them, and then they actually tried to use their access to delete and alter tables in the database. And so it sounds like they may not have gotten a, a root shell through their SQL injection, but what they may have been able to do was do sort of arbitrary SQL commands on the data itself, and they found that they couldn't do certain things, whatever that web process had, didn't have the privileges to drop tables. Um, luckily enough. I really like the Kennesaw State University story, so if you weren't here earlier and heard Logan Lamb talking about what he and Chris Grayson um, did, I think it's important because this is sort of things that you can do, you know, looking at uh, election websites, looking at what the Google cache may have grabbed from an election website, um, writing scripts that try and uh, see what the exposure, if there is exposure there, is, and then reporting it to people is all very important. Um, and here, not only did they have a, this Drupal Geddon, a vulnerable, vulnerable version of the Drupal content management um, software, but they also had Wi-Fi access points that uh, were attached to their in, internal airgap, airgap network, right? So an airgap's great until someone <laughs> decides to put a Wi-Fi access point on your airgap network that you don't know about that's been there for years, right? And so there's a really good after action report by the Kennesaw State University IT people that basically says, Here's all the bad things they, that we found them doing. Here's how it's never gonna happen again. And um, it's kind of a slap on the wrist, pretty big slap on the wrist for Kennesaw State, um, for the election people, but at the same time, it shows here are all the things that you should never do with the, the, the quantity and quality of sensitive voter data and, and software, you know, actual software that Russians would love to grab and decompile and you know, make tool chains for things that could you know, successively just try things out until they found the right thing to, to do. Anyway, that's all, so I'd love to uh, get your questions, Candace and I. Um, I tried to think of some legal resources. Um, there's a great election law list that's mostly law, but they, they do entertain questions from novices like me. Um, if you ever find yourself uh, in trouble or um, Getting close to being in trouble, I'd really recommend you talk to someone like me who has a lot of lawyer friends or the EFF's uh, legal intake uh, system is very well honed. It's a trouble ticketing system where they can um, get you some help, um, especially if you're a good defendant. So we'd really love to see some people that, um, that, that are, that are uh, uh, they're good defendants <laughs> to make some good precedent out here. Anyway, and I have my contact here, PGP, Signal stuff, if, if you don't wanna, um, uh, talk directly, feel free to, to um, grab me any way like that. Uh, um, and we'd love to take your questions. Sir, you want to shout? Just shout. Yeah, I can shout. I'll um, repeat them. So a lot of states have, I mean, virtually all states have an analog to the CFAA. And some are actually kind of broad, like Massachusetts uh, computer fraud law is really broad. Um, are you guys working with any state legislatures to amend this? I know they are, uh, every year there's some amendments, but are you working with any state legislatures? I'll just say, it's so hard to do state legislative work, like we're doing it with the broadband privacy stuff now, and that's really sort of like putting out fires left and right that we haven't really put, spent a lot of time thinking about um, computer fraud at the state level. Uh, but yeah, you, definitely let me know about ones that, that are either being used in ways that are overbroad or ways that you think there might be people who want to um, narrow them down a little bit. And it's not like we don't want to make sure the cops can't uh, uh, you know, actually fight crime, it's just that 
these tend to be used in the ways where people who just don't understand the technology um, think want to make a, an example of people like our dear friend Aaron Swartz, which is you know very unfortunate. Um, that's fine. Other questions? Yes. So apropos that, uh, EFF has the Electronic Frontiers Alliance, which is a campus network organization. And e at info at EFF.org will get you through to them. If, uh, if one way that we can do state level work is through those campus organizations. There's full-time organizers at EFF to assist campus organizations to work on that. I didn't know that. That's yeah. awesome. I didn't either. Excellent to know. Oh, Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Comments? Sure, yell it. Yes. Uh, It, it's it's an ongoing problem, and you you fingered it quite nicely. Uh, there there are many worse abuses, as you know. There there, so uh, but these are they're largely volunteers. They're paid a per diem, which is is trivial. Uh, they tend to be retirees, um, and they tend to operate on the basis of um, sort of custom rather than law, and, and many states don't even require them to go to a training uh, session that is meaningful. When I was um, the public monitor of Cuyahoga County, Ohio's um, election reform, and I had been on the election review panel, one of the things we recommended was not only to beef up poll worker training, but also to have a test afterwards and we were probably the first in the nation to do so, and uh, it's still ongoing that way, and it did boost uh, the, the morale as well, because you can imagine how de de demoralizing it is for those who, have, who know how the, the, the law operates to protect voters, and, and then others who are in the poll worker positions and maybe even running the poll, polling uh, location aren't implementing the law and are, are very cavalier about it. Um, so it, it does provide some fodder for a, a new standard, and I incur, again, every, I think Joshua, where's Joshua, is he still here? Joshua recommended that you sign up to be poll workers. We need more technically proficient people as poll workers, and many counties will have you actually be the ones to set up the technology, sometimes to, to be the rover to help fix it, troubleshoot, um, to monitor the security operations in the precinct or several precincts. Uh, we need people with security backgrounds there, right, Joshua? And, um, and, the, the, and also you can then contribute by helping often with poll worker training on some of the security issues because these manuals are developed sometimes at the local level with not very much understanding of, of some of these points. So, so again, there are many ways that you can be helpful. Yeah, and, and a, a couple other things. Um, at least during the general elections, there's this massive nonpartisan effort called the Election Protection Coalition, and they often need people with different kinds of substantive knowledge, either be it political science, be it uh, uh, you know cybersecurity, be it whatever, to basically be sub subject matter experts for when you get crazy calls from from Podunk, Arkansas, or something, saying, "Hey." Should we restart this machine? That's actually a pretty hard question. Usually, you know, if you've done you know, your family IT stuff, that's the first thing you tell people to do. But some of these machines can lose voter data if you turn them off. And so there are, you know, we have uh, what are called rap sheets for voting machines that basically tell you things about whether or not uh, this machine can be treated like that. And th the other thing I'll say is uh, I, I have a mixed methods research background when I was in academia. before. I used to think I could be a professor, but uh, anyway, uh, that, that's long been dashed on the rocks. But, uh, but one study we did that I can point you to was a qualitative study of uh, poll workers uh, in Marin, I don't think I'm allowed to say it. Well, I just did, sorry. Uh, 
a county in California, uh, we did a qualitative study of their mental models of privacy and security. And so what did they think was particularly sensitive? You know, how did they approach it? And we recommended a bunch of things. Um, unfortunately, there were a lot of, of juicy but unfortunate tales. For example, there was one uh, uh, judge, the, one, the person who runs the, 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 the polling place, who there were so many jams with this optical scan machine that he kept the door to the, the ballot uh, uh, box open all day long. And the reason he did that because it was a pain in the butt for him with his arthritic fingers to turn the key because uh, about 10 or 12 times a day you had to clear a jam and the thing. So he would just keep it open. Uh, and I just asked him as an observer, I was like, well, what do you think that tamper tape you broke was for? And he had to sit there and think about it. And later he's like, oh, you know what? I, I probably shouldn't have busted that till the end of the polls, or at least without putting another one over it, and he shut it and sealed it off. And that's a, a more participant ob observation, and so if you can keep your eyes open and you see something glaring like that happen, even just you know asking an intuitive, maybe yogic kind of question, like, hey, why is that door open? That looks pretty important. You know, That can often cause people to, to um, uh, uh, think harder about it and maybe not change immediately, but uh, uh, and if you have partisan poll watchers in the room, <laughs> they may go file legal pleadings and actually force this to happen quicker. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'll shut up. Any more questions? Oh yeah. So uh, the best disclosures I've seen lately have been directly to CERT or the FBI, and and you know if if they the hard part is you can't do everything through them because if we did everything through them they would fall apart. We don't want them to fall apart. And the other thing is we we wouldn't have public knowledge, and part of the problem that we've had in the financial uh, systems as well, until we started having breach disclosure laws, then the industry was able to say, we have no breaches. Your, your money is absolutely secure. And we will not uh, obtain better technologies, more support for security in elections unless we know the vulnerabilities and the security exploits. So I'm a great fan of breach disclosure. Yeah, yeah I do think that the one thing I would say is that it's a really interesting case study because it, if you look at what it took to get someone to care, it was notifying Kennesaw State's badass university information technology people who, like, they have, I don't know what it is. It's, it's, it, I should show you this after action report because they walk through with signal uh, analyzers and stuff to see what's emanating what from where and all this kind of stuff. But that, that's kind of the case-by-case the case nature of some of this stuff is you have to find the one person who can you know, care enough to make the change. And there it was someone who basically like, look, this is a rogue IT shop on our campus that's making us look bad. And, and that's what made it happen there. But I, the FBI or, or CERT are often a really good way to do that. Like if you look at the stuff that uh, Chris Vickery has done recently with uh, abandoned S3 buckets, he often instantly just notifies the FBI and lets them take care of it because if the FBI comes to you and says, hey, you have a problem, you're going to, unless you're the DNC, uh, pay attention most of the time. Uh, and I think they will in the future. We have one here and one here. Okay. So with regard to um, Trump's proposal about having all of the elect state elections centralized at a central location by the federal government, um, without discussing like political ramifications or anything like that, what are the security risks for doing that kind of system and having it centralized? Mm -hmm. That would take a long discussion, but we can say uh, quickly, and I'll pass the mic to Joe, it would um, raise the security uh, concerns substantially. Um, and and <laughs> I'll pass to you. We really try not to put all the jewels in one place, right? And, and with this, with the voter data that the, the Kobach Commission had requested, um, not only is it putting substantial amount of sensitive data in one place, and I'm happy to argue with any of you afterwards about whether or not voter files are sensitive data. I think they are. Um, so, so there's that part. But there's also in the letter, it was like, hey, email these records to us. And if, I mean, on the White House server. email is the worst. And I wish email would just die, but it's also one of the hardest things to secure. You know, there's not a, there, there's very few ways to do it. And most of them are really hard to do correctly. And the other one was, hey, you could use this, this uh, DOD uh, upload site that if you use in any browser, because the DOD uses a certificate that is not part of any of the browser's roots of trust, you would see this big red screen that said, hey, someone's trying to attack you. And then the only way to get around it was to click through this and say, oh, no, no, I was expecting that, which is just, 
there was a lot of bad security, uh, what we would call a, a bad uh, um, design patterns and security there that, that were sort of working against anything there uh, being particularly secure. And, and so we don't want all our, our, our jewels in one place, and we also want the process of getting jewels to certain places to be highly secured. And so there's other uh, groups like ERIC, the Electronic Registration Information Center, that does uh, things with multi-state voter registration data in very careful ways using um, some more advanced cryptography. And so you're not actually transmitting anything that could be useful, but it's useful for matching and saying, hey, someone moved from this state to this state, you might want to send a postcard to their old address. Um, and we, we would need more transparency and accountability for uh, where that sensitive data is. Next. I'm sorry, the deputy CTO. CTO okay. Um, one of the projects that we work on in the aftermath of the uh, November election was a recount in North Carolina. And the technology that we built for facilitating legalizing uh, ballot access voters and running that recount was built quickly. It didn't wind up being deployed. I'm curious as to what your thoughts are on state laws regarding recount elections and uh, procedures for doing that. Uh, I'll answer and then I'll pass to Joe. Um, uh, I was born in North Carolina. I'm aware of the laws. Uh, part of the history in North Carolina was, as you may recall, a prior election, I think in maybe 2006 or 2008, where there was an election for superintendent of public instruction or something that continued as far as recount processes for a month or two. So it was into January, maybe later. Um, so the, the fear, again, as I was suggesting, is that we will not have repose, that it will keep going, and that people will never trust the result because it's taken us so long to get there. And, and another concern, uh, frankly, is that if we continue to take a lot of time for a recount process, the evidence may also change. Some of the votes may be tampered with some of the, the evidence, basically. And so, so there are a number of worries about it. M my personal belief is that, uh, and, and having studied these laws, is that A, uh, the recount laws are highly antiquated. They were not structured for electronic voting and the needs that we have for protecting elections and assuring. And, and keep in mind, we do have a federal right, which is reiterated in many state constitutions as well, but a right to have our votes counted and re recorded and counted accurately. Constitutional right. It has not been really vindicated through litigation the way it's gonna have to be, but we should have states conforming or, or updating their laws to facilitate the forensics analyses or some of the other techniques that you're suggesting to, to, to um, support effective recounts. Um, but we haven't even done the thinking about that. Instead, there's this, this push for throwing the cloak over it, get it over with, move on, let's not look too closely. I, I, I guess I'll talk to you off offline because I, I'm already running in my head through like playbooks and configuration <laughs> templates for standing up recount support structure infrastructure, but um, I don't want to <laughs> talk about that out loud. Uh, maybe the last question? Just one, question. Just one more question. 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 Do you have a question, sir? Oh, oh Larry. <laughs> Yeah, and so uh, Larry asked a question about um, a lot of the technology now is using ballot images and presenting ballot images as part of audits to um, election officials and to voters to, to show um, certain kinds of ballots that may be marginal or they have to, add, what's the right word, adjudicate, you know, in order to be able to tell it goes one way or another. And what's the law with being able to show um, ballots to people? I don't have a real crisp answer for you other than it is sort of unsettled right now. You know, one of the main places this is happening is with um, the ACLU with law, with um, uh, uh, the ACLU has a, has a number of ongoing sort of campaigns about ballot selfies. 
So can you take a picture of your face next to your ballot? They claim that's political free speech. Um, I, don't, I just disagree with that. I love my ACLU friends, but I think that, there, that uh, there's a lot of value in having people not being able to display how they voted to people on purpose. It may be a, a little better when it's not directly associated with the voter's identity, like in the case of in a recount. I think it would be a just totally different. I think we're going over, but yeah. thank, thank you. you so much.